Thank you, Glenn, for that uh, heartfelt introduction. <clears throat> so when Glenn asked me to uh, be a keynote speaker here at this conference that uh, he was putting together in a seamless fashion with the one week celebration of 150 years of Sri Aurobindo, <clears throat> He wanted to bring Jean Gebser in conversation with other integral thinkers that people know about, including Sri Aurobindo, Tela de Chardin, and C.G. Jung. So my talk today is about the common subject that all these thinkers share. And I've given the title in terms of Sri Aurobindo's, one of his chapters from the human cycle, the end of the curve of reason and the emergence of integral consciousness, which is an aspect of this particular conference. So we are looking at these four thinkers that Glenn has uh, highlighted. Shah Gebser dates 1905 to 1973. Actually, he's the youngest of the lot, the baby of the, of the group. Sri Aurobindo, the eldest of those contemporaries, 1872 to 1950. Carl Jung, very close to Sri Aurobindo, 1875 to 1961. And Teilhard Pierre, Teilhard de Chardin, 1881 to 1955. Now there are four turn of the century thinkers, turn of the last century, 19th, between the 19th and the 20th centuries. And the other way to characterize their work, at least this aspect of their work is that they are philosophers of history. Now, the whole idea of the philosophy of history, philosophers of history, is a little alien to us today. It's a trend of thinking that is initiated in the late 18th century. And this is towards the end of what we call the Enlightenment era, and includes in a major way people like Georg Hegel. And the aim of these thinkers, particularly Hegel, who is really a major, major figure of the last part of the Enlightenment, is to rationalize the telos of the Enlightenment. This is really what Hegel does. He gives us a philosophy of history in which rationality, the mind, is evolving and ultimately becomes the completely self expressive reality, ontology of the, uh, of the world. Now, a hundred years later, at the head of the 20th century, a new image of the whole emerges in response to the increasing diversification of the world. So something else is happening at the end of the 19th slash 20th century. There is, all these thinkers are talking about the deficient mental structure. That's, that's a term that uh, Gebser uses, but all of them are seeing the problems of reason. And they're seeing the fact that we've en entered an age where there is the possibility of a dystopia due to the extreme diversification and the specialized, ultra specialization that is occurring that actually we experience even more today. But these are the forefront thinkers of the time who vision that, who understand that. And so in response to that, they look towards not the immediate, not the today, not the trajectory of what is given, but a vaster trajectory of history. How do we contextualize the entire age in which we find ourselves against a backdrop of a larger sweep leading out of mind 
leading beyond mind. And so this is the whole notion of integral thinking that begins at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, after the 1970s, this trend has been discouraged. This is the reason why we don't hear so much about this type of thinking today. Why? Because postmodern philosophy thinks of this, labels this trend of thinking as an approach to a theory of everything, a T-O-E, a toe. That's a theory of everything, okay? Theories of everything are seen as suspect in our times. And the reason they are seen as suspect is that there can be many theories. We've awoken to the fact that each person can give you a different theory of everything. And these theories of everything may have overlaps, but they're not the same. And yet you can create cults out of them. You can create ideologies out of them. You can become a, a fanatic of any one of them, claiming that that is the I, uh, ideal description of the world. And so there's been a suspicion towards all theories of everything in our times, starting from around the 1980s or so. And so we don't see much of this happening these days. Yet, a philosophy of history is implicit in Heidegger, and it's explicit in Foucault, who talks about epistems in his early work. But most of the other people stay away from talking about philosophies of history in our times. Other postmodern thinkers have shied away from the philosophy of history. Now, another century has passed. We are talking about one turn of the century at the end of the Enlightenment, a second turn of the century with the thinkers that we are talking about. And now we're looking at them after another entire century, at the turn of the 20th and 21st century. And in an era of close global interdependence and ultra specialization, it is really important for us to revisit the foundations of integral thinking with a view to answering the question, what is the problematic of our time? Because in a way, we are so interdependent right now, we cannot escape from thinking about holes. We can talk about, let's go back to some particular idea of who we are, where we are, identity politics, but there is a way in which something much more whole is inviting us. And that's the reason why it is important for us to revisit these thinkers as I see it today. So here are the four thinkers. All these four express their theories of history in terms of quaternaries. See, quaternaries are fours, the fourfold. The fourfold is a favorite with many of them, particularly with C.G. Jung, because it's a symbol of the circle or cycle, you see the circle, which becomes the basis of the mandala. Jung was very, uh, you know, interested in the idea of the mandala, the circle. The circle is an image of completeness that can be divided into four. It can also be a cycle. In other words, a circle that circles into another spiral. And these four then lead to a fifth which is the initiation of a new four. So we see that each one of them has a set of four. With Kepser, we have the four structures of consciousness, the archaic, the magic, the mythic, and the mental, and leading out to the integral. With Sri Aurobindo, we have another set of four in his human cycle. He's adapting uh, a German thinker, Lamprecht, but he's also bringing him into conversation with the Yuga theory of Hinduism, of Indian thought. And he calls these four 
the symbolic age, the typal age, the conventional age, and the individualistic age opening out to the spiritual age or the uh, integral age. <clears throat> now with Tale of the Chardin, we have a fourfold. We have the geosphere, the biosphere, the psychosphere, and the new sphere. And then this leads further out to what he calls the omega point and to his notion of Christogenesis. And with Carl Jung, we have what he calls the four platonic months. These are the astrological um, constellations of Taurus, Aries, Pisces, and Aquarius, leading in his idea also to a spiritual age. So these are the four folds that have been proposed by each of these thinkers. And I'm not going to get into a description of each of these fours, but what really interests us is the transition from the third to the fourth, or if it's a system of four leading to five, it's really from the fourth to the fifth. You see, that's, that's the transition that interests us because we are part of it in our times. So first, Jean Gebser, since our consideration today is primarily that of Jean Gebser, and in relation to him, we are thinking of the others, we see his structures of consciousness that mutate in time, in history. And for him, these mutations take place automatically, almost. It is as if that a certain structure outlasts or, or, or a certain structure you know, is, is ends, it, it, it finishes. And these structures have a efficient and a deficient, almost a sinusoidal, um, way of unfolding and they come to a sort of end and something new emerges out of them and that's how these four structures move and for him now we are in this transition from the mental to the integral age this is what the book ever present origin is really about the central topic there is this transition from the mental to the integral age, along with a clarification of these earlier structures as well. Now, how did this come to him? So Gebser tells us explicitly, in the winter of 1932-33 in Spain, in a lightning-like inspiration, he became aware of the concept of the development of a new consciousness which was the integral. So this suddenly uh, an, an intuition and an experience opened up in him. According to Gebser, the last, the age that we are finding ourselves in is the mental age. It's deficient properties begin manifesting in full force from the 13th century, which is a little before the Renaissance. And the failures of the deficient rational that he deals with particularly throughout his book, but particularly towards its end, when he's talking about the dangers of the you know, possibility of the integral age not achieving what it needs to achieve, they, the failures are mainly to summarize atomization and technological dehumanization. He's very conscious of the fact, and to the whole idea of Gebser, there is a temporal quality, a quality of time. The quality of time of mental consciousness is one that focuses on the now. In a way, it denies the past. It's always running away from itself. It is focused on novelty, on generating the surface of our existence as the screen from which we develop new surfaces. So that is the temporal amnesia that we experience. We are constantly forgetting who we were and we are acting as if we are right now here. It's, it's, an, it's a false eternal present, as it were. 
And this leads to perpetual novelty. We are competing to overcome whatever we have produced. We are trying to produce something new and notion of rational progress is arising out of that. Now, how does he present his theory to us? It's very interesting to read his book is really quite remarkable because it's not metaphysics in the metaphysical sense. It's not history or descriptive. It's, I would call it a phenomenology of the integral, a phenomenology of the integral because he is expressing his experience using terms that he invents as he goes along. And as you read him, you experience it. See, this is the remarkable use of language that he innovates and he talks about the new statement, the statement of the integral consciousness. And this is something I believe he's doing. The integral structure of consciousness is characterized by a new time consciousness, the coexistence of all time in direct perception. This is why the ever present origin has always been present throughout history, but it has always been covered by representations. These representations are the forms of these ages, but it is as if now the ever present origin has to turn all these representations transparent. They exist, that's why he uses the term diaphaneity. They exist, we see through them. Everything is seen as if all time exists right now. Coexistence of all time in direct perception. He uses terms like verition, or he adapts from Whitehead the term concrescence and many other terms that are related to this way of seeing. What is his praxis? Does he give us a praxis? Does he tell us what we are supposed to do? Reading him itself is the praxis. That's the primary praxis because this is contemplative philosophy. And this is a point that is should never be uh, under, I mean, over, can, can't be overemphasized. What is contemplative philosophy? Contemplative philosophy is philosophy that in reading opens up its doors to experience. So the contemplative philosophy of reading ever-present origin is that of intuiting concepts. And he creates new concepts on the fly and then expands them, concepts such as the fourth dimension, temporics, <coughs> cystasis and cineresis, Verition, diaphaneity. These are beautiful words that he, he doesn't explain in an explanatory sense as in a dictionary, but he uses in a way that it opens its meaning to us as we read it in its context. Now, what does he show us as the various ways in which this integral consciousness is expressing? Because he's saying it's already expressing. It's something that's happening around us. We are in the middle of this mutation that's occurring. And some of the leading personalities of our times are automatically expressing it. And the primary examples he gives us first and foremost are coming from the arts. So he gives us examples from the visual arts, the arts of cubism, of people like Picasso and Braque. And he also shows us where some of these forms are veering off in wrong directions. He, he has an analysis of uh, moder modernism as a, a kind of 20th century art movement. And similarly, he talks about a lot about poetry. He's talking about Rilke and even goes back to Holderlin and others of um, the modern age. Paul Valery, these are important poets that he is probing for their use of language to show how it's no longer a symbolic language, for example. It's no longer a language of 
emotion that he would call sort of psychistic, it's a term he uses, but it's a language of perception. It's a language that is pushing you into a new kind of perception of reality. So these are the primary ways that the integral structure is being understood and explained by Kepser. But then the last chapters of uh, the ever-present origin open this up into a variety of other ways, including um, philosophy, physics, biology, jurisprudence, sociology, and ecology. So he has about five chapters where he's talking about what's the difference in the shift that's taking place. So if we think about the, 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 the time in which Gebser finds himself and the way in which he expresses himself in this phenomenology of integral consciousness, one may say, there's many things he misses out because we are looking at him from today. Because one of the interesting things one finds at the turn of the 19th and 20th century in thinkers of this kind is a kind of optimism. They all have a kind of optimism that fades as the century progresses. And all of them are present during both the world wars. And in a sense, it has an effect on them. And I'm going to talk more about that later. But there is a sense that these new ways of seeing and expressing that we find in Western modernism, um, and also in science, for example, in Western modern science, are creating a revolution that will seamlessly catapult us into the integral age. I would say that does not happen. There is a derailment that takes place at some point of time, which is not necessarily seen by these thinkers. So I say there is an absence in the analysis of the deficient phase in terms of things like capitalism, industrialism, colonialism, racism, ecological devastation, neoliberal globalization, which is after his time, of course. Though Gebser is very conscious of the evils of the dehumanization of a mode of rational, of technological modernity, you see, which is, um, I don't know which is doing what because I've got some funny thing over there. Anyway, it, it, he's very conscious of that. Now we move on to Sri Aurobindo who precedes uh, Gebser. With Sri Aurobindo, we find another set of structures of time. And he's actually, as I said, bringing together, making converge a theory of history that is given by a German of the 19th century, Lamprecht. And it opens up for him a certain kind of a convergence with an understanding of the Yuga system in India as a structure of time a kind of a unit with four phases that can be fractal. See, you can even in your day have it, in your life have it, in smaller cycles of time have it, and in the large cycle of history that we experience, we can have it. And these are ages like the symbolic age, the typal age, the conventional age, and the individualistic age leading to the subjective age. And then that becomes the spiritual or integral age. But just very briefly in relation to Gebser, a symbolic age is so-called, because these words can be confusing. We sometimes think of coming to symbolization as the very function of language. Language turns our reality into symbolic reality. But what Sri Aurobindo means by symbolic age is that everything in reality is a symbol of something deeper and it automatically expresses that. Everything expresses the symbol that meant, it's meant to be. This is the Vedic age in its origin, known as Satya Yuga. There is no conflict with anything because everything 
it's by its self uh, you know, knowledge of its relations with the whole that it expresses itself. But symbolic age can also mean a kind of deficient symbolic age where these symbols become fixed and your consciousness is trying to hold on to the symbols. And there is a higher type of that sort of distance that we can talk about with a typal age, that we have types. Now we have types rather than symbols. And there is an attempt to hold on to these types and express reality through, through them. A further hardening can occur. And then what happens is that the types become conventions. And conventions are, we, we could relate these to, you know, the symbolic age could roughly be related to maybe the magic structure. The typal age could be roughly related to the mythical structure or, or even the conventional age could be properly uh, related to the mythical structure because the mythical structure is really about creating symbol systems that are made into conventions. See, like religions, you create creeds, you create symbols that everybody has to follow. They become customary. So they become conventions. An entire society is made to run according to conventions. So that is a conventional age and then Sri Aurobindo says that inevitably in this sort of move from the symbolic age to the hardening of the conventional age, the spirit of the human revolts. And that revolt leads to the individualistic age. And the individualistic age is marked by, in its first emergence, marked by rationality. So in our times, he sees this very transition taking place exactly as we are talking about with regard to all these other structures as the, the individualistic age beginning with a reaction to the dark ages of Europe. Okay, in other words, the entire religious um, structure of, of Europe and it becomes a age of rationalism. So the conventions are defied individualism emerges. The problem with individualism is that it exacerbates exclusive difference. Everybody is an individual. Nothing holds us together. The further we go, the less we agree. And then we find that we can't you know, create a world. We only create a chaos. See? So what's the solution? Sri Aurobindo is not telling us, let's go back to the conventions or let's go back even to a symbolic age. He's saying from a deepening of the individual, we come to the subjective age. Subjectivism, the subjective quality of the individual will give us something that ultimately connects with the universal. See? That's where the subjective age deepens to a spiritual age. Subjective age shows us the turn within, a deeper individualism in search of individual universals, leading to a spiritual or integral age of unique realizations of the one. Now this no, notion, unique realizations of the one, I believe this is what is at the heart of the integral as these thinkers are thinking about it, not necessarily the integral as supermind, but at, at this level. Sri Aurobindo has a metaphysics that goes, and I'm not going to go into that metaphysics in detail over here because I think we have time constraints, but just to name it, it is the metaphysics of the sacrifice of the Purusha that comes to us from the Veda. See? There is one being, the being becomes many beings, but remains one in the many and realizes its oneness in and through the many over time. Let's put it like that as a, a kind of a nutshell. 
the praxis, he gives us several approaches to praxis to uh, arrive at that. But I highlight one approach that he gives in the life divine called the triple transformation. So the fragmentation we experience is at three levels. It's at the level of the individual. We have heterogeneous faculties. Each of the faculties, just like the senses, we have will, we have thinking, we have the body, various ways of being coexist inside us. How do we find something which unites them, which is an integral, which is not the domination of one by the other, not the mind dominating the life, the will, or the body, but finding something that is the essence of each, See, the essence of each, that is the psychic. So that's the psychic transformation which uh, rests on that. The cosmic, the spiritual transformation, which brings down a higher consciousness of unity into ourselves through which we experience the oneness behind all the differences of the world. And finally, there is a third level, which is what he calls the supramental transformation and to which he adduces the term integral. That's the integral consciousness, which we are going to do. It is, I will point out later, a plane of consciousness beyond the mind and one in which radical plurality and absolute unity are the same. But that is, I'd say, the problematic, in fact, of our times. What does Sri Aurobindo show as examples that we are moving in that direction? He gives two kinds of examples. One is just like Gebser, modernism, the new kinds of creative culture that are emerging at that time. In the very second chapter of the human cycle, he tells us, we are no longer satisfied with the way in which we have, you know, done our poetry, art, etc. A rational formulation. See? So poetry, art, music, philosophy are being expressed in a new way, which is subjective. It's no longer objective, but subjective. And it may be the beginning of a subjectivism, but he says it's the beginning that will move us to a true spiritual age. But the other aspect that he introduces, which Gebser does not, because he is a post-colonial thinker, a, a national thinker and a post-colonial thinker, is politics. So a lot of his work is about nationalism and it's also about the difference between a true and a false nationalism. The, False nationalism is the rational nationalism, which is the nationalism of exclusive identities. The true, sub, uh, 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 true subjectivism is a subjectivism that honors our cultural histories, that finds our unity with our past, can actually embody all our past, and at the same time is porous to enter into communication with others, other cultural histories, knowing the universals in all of them. And that's a very important point in our understanding our own age today, which is so riven by exclusive identity politics. So he addresses a number of things. He addresses capitalism, industrialism, colonialism in his work. But at his time, corporate technology and ecological devastation are not yet major problems, nor has neoliberal globalization uh, appeared. So these do not enter into his consideration. Pierre Teller of the Chardin, he has his fourfold, the geosphere, the biosphere, the psychosphere, and the new sphere leading to, to the omega point or the idea of anthropogenesis as Christogenesis. So this notion of Christogenesis, he's a Christian. The idea is that there is an evolution that's taking place into higher levels of complexity. And at the human, our culture is producing a new level of complexity. 
This is cultural complexity leading to universals. So there is a certain kind of a universal consciousness that we are creating through our culture. And that consciousness is something that is available to us. This is long before you know, computers or, or you know, cyberspace or anything like that. But it is available to us. And just like we found with, with Gebser, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, while conducting paleontological research, he was a paleontologist and a, a, a um, priest in the Ordos desert, he received a vision and an intuition, as he says, of cosmic evolution. He calls it an ontological drift. He saw that with anthropogenesis as a crucial moment. So he sees this as a, a you know, again, it's a, like Kepsa, that's why his work has that phenomenological quality. He's not just giving us descriptive ideas. He's seeing and saying, you see. There's a history to it, but at the same time, there is a quality of revelation in a lot of his work. And he's talking about the fact that this layer that we've created, so to say, has its own consciousness and it can spark off as a form of consciousness that we can experience. That's the new sphere, the layer of thinking. That is, this is what's caused it, the global network of science, technology, and information increasingly absorbs and transforms the geosphere and the biosphere. Now, looking at it, this from our vantage, it's an ambiguous statement because the whole notion of the Anthropocene could be read into this, see? But he says, contrary to anthropocentrism, Tehard emphasizes that this is not brought about by human beings. He points to something greater than ourselves, the spirit, the omega point, like an attractor, moving forward within us and drawing us towards this future. He has a metaphysics. The metaphysics is this omega point is drawing the entire evolution. And connection with the new sphere is a stage which individuals can experience at some point and having experienced can internalize. This universal internalization will multiply the inner Christ in all of us. This is Christogenesis. Christ is not one human that came at a certain point and redeemed humanity, but Christ is a consciousness that will multiply itself in every individual at that stage of uh, evolution. Now, his praxis is also contemplative as brought out more powerfully later by his, I'd say, followers and numerous thinkers inspired by him, such as Thomas Berry, Mary Evelyn Tucker, John Grimm, and Brian Swim, who was here until very recently uh, as a faculty of, uh, of PCC. Now, he's been severely criticized by a number of people. One of them during his lifetime was Jacques Lacan. And Lacan criticized him on the grounds that this entire idea of complexification has to be talked off along with entropy. Every stage of complexification develops a lot of debris, useless garbage, he called it. See? So he says, failure to acknowledge the entropic power of complexity is something that he held Tela uh, de Chardin responsible for. Similarly, after one of the people that he had a very strong influence on was the Canadian media philosopher, Marshall McLuhan, who as a philosopher of media and cyber technology seen as aspects of the new sphere. So this is a now, this is what happens. It's almost inevitable in his language that we'll start seeing cyberspace as the new sphere. It's, it's implicit in his uh, language. And 
McLuhan also is prior to the, the era of the cyberspace, but is another visionary who already sees it, right? But this has been critiqued for the fascist and corporate overdetermination of these media in our times. Now we could say that corporate overdetermination of the internet of cyberspace or fascist overdetermination of the cyberspace are functions of consciousness are not necessary to cyberspace itself. But cyberspace could be a new sphere if we prepared ourselves properly for it. And this is, I guess, how uh, Tel Aviv Chardin saw it. He also inspired Gaia theorists and a vision of the new sphere as a stage in the pluralization of Christ in individuals, as I mentioned, Christogenesis. A quote from Teilhard, the day will come when after harnessing space, the winds, the tides and gravitation, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, we shall have discovered fire. So this statement shows us that, you know, this layer that we are calling new sphere is not just a super heady, uh, you know, sort of function of our mental capacities, that it is led by love and that really it's return to us is something that opens up, I think this metaphor of fire, I draw attention to it because this is the Vedic Agni, which is the essence of the psychic being. So in a way, there is an acknowledgement of that. Now, I know that I'm, uh, am I running out of time? Yeah. I have some time. I have some time. Okay. So I'm going to Jung now. And Jung has four platonic months, Taurus, Aries, Pisces, and Aquarius. Um, just a moment. Leading to a spiritual age. He also has the notion, now one thing to note about these ages and particularly the transition we are talking about is the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And this, this would be very well known to new age people. We talk about the, the great movie Hair and the age of Aquarius, right? We are here in the age of Aquarius, 1997. He gave two years, actually, he did two calculations. One was 1997 and the other was 2200. He, he said, take your pick. I'm not sure which one of these is true. So, the, the difference between the two, and you can see it in the symbol, Pisces is symbolized by two fish that are constantly rotating one following the other in a medium of water. And Aquarius is the water carrier who has a pitcher of water and pours that water. So water is a central symbol in this transition. And when we think about Pisces, we see, and we, we, when we read his, I'll, I'll read you his quotes about this and you'll see what I mean. We find that there is a dualism in the mental age, which is a entangled dualism that two are always in, in, inextricably bound to each other. They rotate again and again. But, and the medium, the water as the medium is a medium that we don't have any control over. It's just like fish don't know what water is. We are in the water. So we are subject to the medium, just like Gebser's talking about this, these representations that we are subject to, you know, and the integral age cuts through that. And in the same way, the age of Aquarius, the water is no longer the medium in which we are floating, but the medium we carry in a pitcher. We are the masters of water. And water, just like in the Gebserian case, can be thought of as the subjective medium. The subjective medium in one sense is time itself. Time is the subjective medium. That's why temporics in Gebser. 
time is something that we have no control over. We are in time. But can we become masters of time? This is part of Gebser's idea of the integral. Can we arrive at a, a stasis in which all time coexists in our consciousness? We are no longer harried and hurried by time. This is a change of consciousness. And that change of consciousness is what he's calling the Aquarian transition. But how is that going to happen? Jung was a Gnostic alchemist. And his symbols and his way of talking have depths, dark depths, I'd say, depths that are hidden. And I'll read you a few quotes that will give us a picture of how he sees this transition. Firstly, he says about the rational age, that, that, that this is the deficient age. By the way, for him, Pisces, the two fish, for him are Christ and the Antichrist. So he's saying that the entire first millennium from the birth of Christ to 1000 CE was the era of Christ. From 1000 CE to 2000 is going to be the era of the Antichrist. This is the deficient phase. The deficient phase that is the opposite. See, and the Antichrist coming into its own towards the end. And that's what he's going to talk about. He says, instead of a brightly colored picture of the real world, we have a bleak, shallow rationalism that offers stones instead of bread to the emotional and spiritual hungers of the world. The picture that unfolds before us is one of universal spiritual distress, comparable to the situation at the beginning of our era or to chaos that followed AD 1000. So this is the beginning of the this deficient cycle for him, the Antichrist era. Then he says, transitions between the aeons always seem to have been melancholy and despairing times, as for instance, the collapse of the old kingdom in Egypt between Taurus and Aries, or the melancholy of the Augustinian age between Aries and Pisces. And now we are moving into Aquarius, of which the Sibylline books say, Luciferis, Luciferi virus ascended, ascended Aquarius acres. Aquarius inflames the savage forces of Lucifer. And we are only at the beginning of this apocalyptic development. Already I am a grandfather twice over and see those distant generations growing up who long after we are gone will spend their lives in that darkness. Considering the terrible time in which we are living, it reminds me of those dark centuries when the culture of antiquity was gradually falling into decay. Now, once again, we are in a time of decay and transition. The vernal equinox is moving out of the sign of Pisces into the sign of Aquarius. Our apocalyptic epoch contains the seeds of a different, unprecedented, and still inconceivable future. The coming new age will be as vastly different from ours as the world of the 19th century was from that of the 20th century, with its atomic physics and its psychology of the unconscious. Never before has mankind been torn into two halves, and never before was the power of absolute destruction given into the hand of man himself. It is a godlike power that has fallen into human hands. So this is what's happening. The entangled reality of the two fish has been sundered, and now the two are separated, and they are at war with each other. Not, neither of them is, uh, you know, a, a function of the other. The approach of the next platonic month, namely Aquarius, will constellate the problem of the union of opposites. It will then no longer be possible to write off evil as the mere privation of good. Its real existence will have to be recognized. 
This problem can be solved only by the individual human being via his experience of the living spirit whose fire was handed onward into the future. So this is the force of individual fire. See, the fire that burns inside us, the alchemical fire that can absorb the shadow and transform it. See, because now what will arise are no longer, is is not, not evil as a privation of good. In other words, it's not that less good or not good is evil. It's as an ontological evil, a separate power itself that will arise. And the only way to deal with it is an even greater power that only the individual holds, the human individual that has to exercise its fire to cause the transformation of the evil that is all around. It's a very uh, profound statement, I'd say, and also extremely gnomic and bears contemplation because it is enigmatic. His metaphysics was an astrological or Gnostic Christology, and his praxis was individuation. This entire cycle of the four is a cosmic individuation that's taking place, in which the absorption and transformation of the shadow by the transformative, uh, okay, but the, okay, I think I'm, Okay, but the transformative alchemy of fire is called for. Now, he also has his failings. He lacks consciousness of the colonial and the post-colonial, though he does address non-rational modes of existence. Now, did they know each other? Gebser is the one who makes direct references to the people that he knew and to the others that we've talked about, particularly Sri Aurobindo. Gebser came across Sri Aurobindo's Life Divine in German in 1957. In the preface to the second edition, 1966, of Ursprung and Gegenwart, which is the German of um, you know, ever-present origin, Reproduced in part in the German trans translation, Gebser cites the following reasons for the addition of new material to the text in, this, in 1970, I think he does that. The additions have been necessary in the light of many ominous as well as encouraging events since publication of the first edition. The ominous aspects are conceivably outweighed and counterbalanced by insights and achievements which by virtue of their spiritual potency cannot remain without effect. Among these achievements, the writings of Sri Aurobindo and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin are preeminent. I think, uh, you know, I think I need, uh, I need uh, power. Power. Okay. Well, yeah. It's, it's, Yeah, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Thanks. No? Yeah, it's coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have to log back in the room. Okay. Okay. It's on. It, it shows. Oh, this is on. Uh, you can just click it again, probably. Got it? You need to do share screen or what? Yeah? Mm. 
and you can minimize this by clicking on it. Yeah, is it good? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, <clears throat> among these achievements, the writings of Sri Aurobindo and Pierre, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin are preeminent. Both develop in their own way the conception of a newly emergent consciousness, which Sri Aurobindo has designated as the supramental. We defined it in turn as the aperspectival, a rational integral consciousness to which we first referred in Rilke and Spain, a book in 1940, and later in our transformation of the Occident in 1943. It remains the principal concern of the present work to elucidate the possibility as well as the emergence of this new consciousness and to describe its uniqueness. The reader will have to judge for himself in what respect our discussion parallels or diverges from those of the authors mentioned, the dissimilarities being occasioned by the differing points of departure. Although both authors have a human universal orientation, Sri Aurobindo integrating Western thought proceeds from a reformed Hindu perspective, Tehad the Chardin from a Catholic position. Whereas the present work is written from a general and occidental standpoint, but this does not preclude the one exposition from not merely supporting and complementing, but also corroborating the others. And in a lecture published in 1970, Gebser made an even stronger statement. He says, it should be kept in mind, my conception of the emerging of a new consciousness, which I realized in winter 1932-33 in a flash-like intuition and started describing since 1939, resembles to a large extent the world conception of Sri Aurobindo that was at that time unknown to me. Mine is different from his insofar as it is directed only to the Western world. So he's acknowledging the scope of his work and does not have the depth and gravity of the origin of the genially represented conception of Sri Aurobindo. An explanation of this apparent phenomenon may be seen in the suggestion that I was included in some manner within the strong field of force as radiated by Sri Aurobindo. Now, the present scenario, I'm wrapping up. Um, where are we now, a century after this? Experimental and revolutionary subjectivism of the first two decades of the 20th century foundered or floundered against the rock of despair raised by the two world wars. See, this is what they were seeing, the subjective age in which all these expressions of the ontological derision that, that uh, Gebser was talking about, it meets with a rock of despair, with two world wars that really have a strong effect on our sense of faith in humanity. See? Tagore talks about it, he dies before the second world war. He, he's, he's despairing, he's saying, all this great civilization that has been built by the West, is this what it comes to? An entire nation of great philosophers, musicians, poets, turned to imprisoning other human beings and enslaving them and killing them. You see, it totally defeats the human spirit. You see, the, the depth of that defeat, we have not got over. We have not been able to return to what it meant to be human before the two world wars of the 20th century. Our loss of faith in humanity, this is not the loss of faith in God, this is the loss, the death of man is with us still. This has to be brought to the forefront, this has brought to the forefront the question of politics or the struggle of collective life to keep open the doors of the possibility of an integral age. No longer now, taken for granted. It's all subject to politics. The aftermath of the Second World War 
leads both to an accelerated corporatization of capital with hyper-technologization, ecological devastation, and post-colonial and post-national radicalization. The subjective arts have felt increasingly marginalized and have entered an era of the politics of culture. Most of what we call the arts right now have to have recognized themselves as political. The era of experimentation has led to the era of survival. At the same time, post-colonial and post-national realities have intervened with radically plural cultural histories and their teleologies. The global present is occupied by four contested trajectories for the future. One, the ironing out of difference and the universalization of modernity with a narrow ultra wealthy class, a swelling bourgeoisie, and a proliferating destitute and disenfranchised population. This is really the modernist dream that everybody will become modern, modern citizens multiplied across the world. The second, the assimilation of all difference as flavors of the world market. No, we will remain different, but we will assimilate them into the world market in a neoliberal global economy. Third, if difference becomes radicalized, the rise of ultra-national competing nations and blocs in a chronic state of economic and military hostilities, which is also what we are seeing all, all around. And fourth, even further into the future possible, a post-national era of warring ethnic, religious, racist, and national identities or their coexist, this is one. And then there's a positive side to it as well. Their coexistence in porous communities of exchange and convergence. This is what we were talking about, subjective, conver a subjective age that opens up the universal in unique ways. From this, the problematic of our age is one of finding a plane of consciousness in which pluralism and monism are the same. In other words, a world of the coexistence of radically plural realizations and expressions of the infinite one. How to arrive at the solution to this problematic is the field of integral theory and praxis, the field of integral studies. This is the what should be the mission of the California Institute of Integral Studies. From Gebser and the other thinkers, one can posit two immediate tasks to the realization of this problematic. One, what Gebser calls temporics. And this I also will draw attention to thinkers like Bergson and to Gilles Deleuze. The experience of the depth of all history with its phylogenetic phases as living in oneself. This depth dimension is found in Sri Aurobindo through the psychic being. The psychic being is the reincarnating element in us. It has lived through history. It carries in itself the very consciousness of time. Others who have given us a lead towards this are thinkers like Hari Bergson, with his attention to the intuition of duration and Gilles Deleuze with his praxis of the three synthesis of time. I don't have time to go into this right now, but basically he's showing us exactly how we can be equal to the entire history that we carry in, inside ourselves, but we forget from moment to moment. The second, subjective universalization. This is what they're all pointing, whether Gebser or Sri Aurobindo is lauding the subjective age as the age of a new kind of creative culture. What's special about that creative culture? What's special about it is that they've thrown all canons aside. We don't need anybody's principles to create art. It comes, the principles come from within. The person who finds their own principle creates according to the accuracy and precision of that principle. The person who does not know that principle 
uses their intuition to understand it. It's what is called the gift of tongues, where one may speak in any tongue, but you understand it because you have come to the root of what has been said. And that, I'd say, is what modernism inaugurated in culture and what Sri Aurobindo opens as the need for intuition in our approach to diverse cultural histories, whether in culture or in politics. Thanks. That's it. Vladimir. Check, 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 check. Um, there is something which, um, which we in our integral yoga milieu think about. It's this, um, the pressure from above, which is causing the answer from below. So yes. everything which is under the carpet is coming to the light. Yes. Yes. Transformed to be met with a new yes. possibility. Yes. So we explain it in that simple way. And it looks like it fits into this scenario, what is happening. Absolutely. I think, Vladimir, it's a um, very important point because normally when we are talking rationally, we don't acknowledge it so easily. But we get a hint of it. Of course, we get it explicitly in Sri Aurobindo, who's saying that it's a two-way process. It's not just that we are trying to solve our problems, but that there is the divine trying to achieve what needs to be achieved through a pressure on the human. See? But interestingly, I think we get similar ideas both with Jung as well as with Tehad the Shardan. But the, the, what the Shardan is saying is that you know this new sphere is also a pressure that we are feeling. We are feeling the pressure of the new sphere. And, you know, he says, just like lighting a match, suddenly something will, will ignite the space in between through that pressure and we'll experience it. So there is a sense of that. And Jung is also talking about where he's talking about this astrological, I didn't talk about that here, but he's saying that in this transition, which is a very difficult transition, because he's, you notice that he's talking about uh, the, the negative force arising in its independence. You know, it's almost like an asura. It's almost like the kind of great asuras of the Puranas, uh, you know, that takes on its own shape. But he also says that drawing from the revelation that this is the hour during this transition that the sun goddess appears, the sun lady, he calls her, this goddess who appears invisibly and moderates this process, see? So there is something that, you know, I mean, we, we are going back in a way to the fact that it's not just we, but it's a cosmic drama of which we are a part and it's happening through us, but there are other forces that are also part of the of the picture and you know we we can hold ourselves to to respond we can think of ourselves as too important in this momentous hour but we are really instruments of some much larger forces that are calling us into this uh, movement and the pressure that you're talking about is absolutely good Another question So uh, thank you very much for your lecture. How do we reconcile the drive for uh, and the vision of integrality in, the hum in humanity with the particularistic secularism, a uh, particular sectarianism of so many of these thinkers? 
Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's the thing you see, uh, you know, I mean, like some, they're coming, they're coming out of different, like, like Gepsa says, they're coming out of different traditions, um, you know, tell other short is expressing himself through Christology, so is Jung through Gnostic Christology, Sri Aurobindo is really drawing heavily on the Upanishads, the Vedas, and that's, that's the language that he's coming through. Um, Gebser is coming through a much more direct phenomenological language. Uh, I'd say that that's exactly what I was saying, that cultural histories have to, you know, I mean, it isn't that I mean, one way of looking at these sectarian differences is that people are um, in bubbles of these sects. But another one, another way to look at it is that these are, these are porous languages that we can use. It, it's the heritage of humanity, see, in the sense that today, um, you know, what, what are called cultural creatives, we are learning each other's languages. And it's not owned by anybody. You see, it's owned by all of us. It's just like the definition of Auroville. Auroville belongs to nobody in particular. Auroville belongs to humanity as a whole. So it's, it's in the same way that these traditions are today to be seen as languages that offer themselves to us to use porously to understand and, and become. See? The other way of looking at it, that they are sectarian, that they belong to sects, is going back to the idea of the mental structure of consciousness, which draws these clear-cut identities around each of us. And a lot of you know, what we call social work today goes in that direction. And I think it's the wrong direction because there's no way out from identity politics of the rational kind. Thank you so much. I wanted to know if there's a better way to understand how we can incorporate or embody the, the syntheses of time that you have talked about. I, I'd say there are many ways. I've I pointed to a few. One of them is this, what Sri Aurobindo calls the psychic being. The psychic being is not clear, clearly available to us, but through yoga, one can come into contact with it. It's the soul, the psyche, the true psyche, which is the reincarnating element inside us. It, it isn't an idea, it's a truth. If, if it opens, then you recognize the fact that you've lived forever and that really you've lived history, that all of history lives in you. Some people experience some past lives, etc., but you may not experience any past life. You may experience or you will experience the concrete sense that you've lived throughout history. See, this is one way. Then there are other ways, like what, the one that Gilles Deleuze is talking about is three synthesis of time. He's saying that we have to analyze our experience of time. They're all passive synthesis. We think that we act, but we are actually passively acting. The first level is our habitual level. It's the passive synthesis of habit. We are constantly doing things that we are not conscious of. The deeper level is when we are conscious of memory as a creative force. See, something happens, but my mind zooms into a, a vast past, my own and the world's, and I bring that into my action. If I do that on a, on a kind of a regular basis, I start becoming conscious of these vaster time you know, realities. And he's saying that the, uh, uh, an even deeper stage can come when all time coexists in us. See? So these are, you have to go through the praxis of any one of these to find it's not easy because what is easy is to become habitual in the now, right now. Sorry, please. Hi. Um... I was really struck by uh, when you talked about um, 
the, the derailment that happened with the two world wars. And um, my mind went to chewing on that. And what came to me, I'm gonna synthesize two ideas here because, you know, I'm like, oh my God, you know, how can we get back on track? As if there is a track, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, there isn't. Uh, but what came was first um, the order disorder paradox, um, which is not uh, an idea by Nathan Schwartz Salant, a Jungian analyst. Um, who says that uh, whenever we create order, it engenders a concomitant disorder. Right. Um, so yeah, the the order that was created at the turn of the that the previous century. Okay, so combine that also with the idea of. Um, Finite and Infinite Games by James Carse. And um, life is an, is an infinite game. Um, but yet within the infinite game, so finite games are meant to be won or lost. Infinite games are played so that the game can continue to be played. And it seems that when we um, conflate those two and we start playing the infinite game as if it were a finite game, that leads to problems too. So I guess my question is what, uh, whose ideas do you, see uh, you know, of those four that can perhaps help us get back on track. And I'm putting that in air quotes um, to, to um, yeah, well, I, that's, that's the end of the sentence. Yeah. So actually starting from the viewpoint of the uh, your, your second observation of the infinite games and the finite games, right? So all these structures of time are, I mean, all these thinkers, they're actually thinking, they're talking about infinite games, the fact that there there is a continuity that is going on, but the continuity follows a structure. In other words, the game is not entirely without rules. The game has stakes to it. And those stakes change and they form, go on and go on and on. But there is a certain, at a certain time, there is a certain game that's going on. So that's the idea. So that's where the whole notion of um, the, the integral comes in. And this whole notion of the four structures of mutation or consciousness, whether we see it, I think in all these four cases, um, and they're different, but at the same time, that's what's remarkable about them. They, they are all intuiting in their unique ways that convergent point. And so there is a certain, you know, I think movement towards that. But as you rightly pointed out, that movement, and I think Jung of all of them envisions the process in through his kind of, you know, um, I mean, uh, a divinatory means, you may say, uh, as one in which it's almost like the derailment had to happen. Because that that's in, in his terminology, that derailment is the sundering of the Pisces into these two, the ontological evil and the ability to now reabsorb it by the individual. It's no longer a cosmic game. It's now a individual game. It's pluralized into individual games and it becomes everybody's responsibility because it's now happening inside them. 
I know there's a few more questions, but um, I'm sorry we're going to have to close down this portion because they'll we need to <laughs> go on with the with the concert um, and then uh, so be permitted to leave the building. Um, but let's give a warm thank you to Devashish Banerjee. Thank you. So